earlier this year, I was walking through a suburban area of Dublin. There was traffic all around me. I wasn't paying that much attention. I had my iPod in my ears. I was on my way to the bus stop. But something caught my eye. Looking around, I saw that a car had pulled out of the traffic and into the bus lane. That's not that odd. But the car stopped right where I was standing. That is odd. As I turned around and looked into the car, I saw the passenger, who was a young teenager, take out her phone, put it up to the window of the car, aim it at me. The camera flashed, the photo was taken, and they drove off. I don't think I've ever felt more upset, vulnerable, or victimized in my entire life than in that one moment. So much of it upset me. But one thing that really upset me was what was the conversation that they had in the car, the driver and the passenger, before they pulled over? What was it about me that made them do that? What did they call me? Really? What did they call me? One thing's for sure, what they didn't say is there's the most stylish person I've ever seen who just happens to have the same size waist as Kate Moss and the same size hips as Nicki Minaj. <laughs> Both of which are true. Sometimes people say to me, Sinead, what should I call you? Well, you can call me a little person. You can call me a teacher. You can call me the alternative Miss Ireland Emeritus. Or you can call me an award-winning blogger. Being a little person can sometimes be a challenge. My greatest challenge in life is that I live in a world that predominantly was built for you. If you take three seconds, imagine what your life would be like if you had to live in a world built for me. Where would you sit? How would you reach things? Would you have backache? Two of the biggest challenges for me are in everyday objects that perhaps you may not even think of. One, for example, is an ATM machine. I can go to the ATM machine, I can put in my pin code, and I can put in my card. But as for the buttons on the screen and being able to access my own money in my account, that's something that I'm not tall enough to do. It's also a security issue, because people can see over my shoulder. Another issue that I have is toilets, in terms of public bathrooms in particular. And you may say, but there's accessible toilets, and there are. But to what extent are they accessible? When I go into those bathrooms, I can lock the door. I can wash my hands, reach the soap dispenser on the sink and the hand dryer. But as for using the toilet, it's too high. Because it's at a height, so those who are wheelchair users can transfer over. An absolute necessity. But if I go into the ordinary toilet, I can't reach the lock. I can't reach the soap dispenser or the sink or the hand dryer, but I can reach the toilet. And there are just some of the daily challenges that I face. But if I'm honest, there has been one thing that has really helped me as a person and as a little person. One statement that sums it all up. I am a loved child. My parents and my family, they are my safe space. They are who I go to when I have a terrible day. They are also the people I contact when I'm celebrating and have amazing achievements and accolades. But the one difference that they made to me in my whole growing up was that from the youngest age, they said that I could do anything that I wanted to do. My father is a little person, my mother is of average height, and my four siblings are all average height. My parents never saw me as different or as anything other than their child. And that stabilization and growth really helped me achieve all those that I've done so far. To give you the earliest example, it goes back to when I was just four years of age, on my very first day of junior infants. Whilst most children at four might be quite upset about leaving their parents, I waved them off, skipped down the corridor, and off I went to the Wendy house in my class. It was at 20 to two when there was a slight difficulty. I cried, lots and lots. It got to a stage where my teachers were quite concerned. They said, is your home space okay? My parents had to assure them, yes. She just loves to learn. She loves to be surrounded by people her own age, and education is what she lives for. 
Thankfully, not much has changed since that day. I trained to be a primary school teacher, and never in any of the years when I said that that's what I was going to do as my future did my parents question it. They never asked if I would be able. It was my dream, my ambition, my goal. They set expectations for me that was as high as the ones that I set for myself. And I must admit that somewhere along the way, I had a sense of confidence, which may be overconfidence and slight naivety. Whilst training to be a primary school teacher my very first year, a classmate sat down beside me and said, how are you going to do this? I kind of thought, how am I going to do what? Is she talking about lunch? Is she talking about the assignment that's due in two weeks? Is she talking about teaching practice? I was completely naive. But soon I realized she meant, how are you going to teach? How are you going to be a teacher? From junior infants onwards, they're going to be bigger than you. You can't reach the blackboard. You can't reach the light switches in the classroom. How are you going to hold control over class? How will parents have confidence in you at your height? She underestimated me. But one of the things that she underestimated it even more was children. They are some of the most open and equal people that you could ever meet. Once you explain to them at an age-appropriate level, they don't understand everything. To give you an example, when I was teaching junior infants, about three days in, a boy put his hand up and said, Miss Burke, why are you so small? A very good question. And I asked him, well, why are you a boy and not a girl? Instantaneously, he was horrified at the thoughts of being a girl. I tried not to be too offended. And he said, I don't know. I was just born like this. And I said, well, so was I. And he said, OK, I'm stuck. Can you help me with this maths? I said, absolutely. And being a teacher is just one string to my proverbial bow. Other things that I do, as I mentioned earlier, is that I'm an award-winning blogger, which sounds quite pretentious. But for as long as I can remember, I have had an insatiable interest in fashion. It was a hunger, predominantly because I felt that it was a world and a domain that I wasn't allowed to enter. I wasn't model height or model size. And really, at that age in teenage years, I could have decided, it's not for me, I'll try something else. But as you may have already realized, I'm a little bit stubborn. So I found my way into the world. I learned as much as I could. I sat reading the business of fashion in Draper's magazine. I knew who was up in a profit and loss last year and who wasn't. And so much information I gathered that I would sit around the dining room table among my family and tell them about Alexander McQueen and the different narratives of mental health that he does in his collections. And my family, they are the most supportive people that you could ever imagine. However, there is only so much you can hear about Alexander McQueen before you say, Sinead, you need to find a friend. <laughs> or somebody that you can talk to about this as soon as possible. And I found online, my friend was a blog online. I cultivated a corner of the internet where I could narrate and comment my interests in fashion, which grew exponentially the more I was interested. However, as you might have already guessed, I'm neither shy nor reserved. And as I learned more, I realized that I had questions that weren't being answered. I wanted to find out more. I emailed designers, people in popular culture, people in film that I admired, and asked if they would meet me. They kindly said yes. It has now become a platform for interviews and conversations for people who interest me and inspire me most. However, a turning point occurred a year ago, when Lorenz Scott, the fashion designer, passed away. The New York Times led with the headline that Mick Jagger's girlfriend had died. As a woman, as somebody who was interested in fashion, I was horrified. Why do we allow the media to talk about and to women like this? But what would I do with my frustration except be angry? I decided to do something about it, in my own small way, with a small audience. And I started a series of interviews called Extraordinary Women. And over the past year, I have had the fortune to meet the most incredible 16 women who are ages from 10 to 80, who tell me about their failures, their goals, their ambitions, their dreams. And I have become a better person because of that. But as I said earlier, I am a teacher. I am a fashion blogger. I am the alternative Miss Ireland. I am a PhD student. I am a broadcaster. And I am an advocate. But if I really think about it, that's not who I am. That's what I do. Who am I? I'm a sister. I'm a daughter. I'm a cousin. I'm a niece. I'm a friend. I am curious. 
I am kind. I am respectful and sympathetic, hopefully, to difference. I am a good listener. But what can you call me? And in particular, those two people who drove the car, who stopped right beside me where I was, who captured the photograph of me. And in the era of social media, I don't know where that is. I don't know what the comments underneath it say. But the one thing that I wish that I could change about that whole scenario, I would like them to call me something. What can you call me? You can call me Sinead.